people who know her say that she makes the best falafel on the planet. I mean, I'll go, I go overseas, I eat in a lot of good restaurants here, falafel. Nobody makes falafel like my wife. She assures us that making the traditional falafel dish is easy when someone shows you how to do it, which she gladly does for us later in the story. And it does seem simple. With few ingredients, there are mainly ground chickpeas flavored with a bit of spices and few steps. So it should be no surprise that this humble bean patty, as tasty as it is, has become loved the world over. Here in the United States, falafel is generally regarded as Middle Eastern fare. If you were to quiz the average American on the background of the sandwich, most likely they would not be able to tell you more than that. The Turks. Turks are men it. Maybe like Turkey or something, but... Not everybody no, knows No, definitely that not. I mean, being from the city, you know, but a lot of places like... We go to school in the middle of nowhere, and I feel like a lot of people <laughs> don't really know where, what it is there. Middle East? I don't really know anything about it. It's certainly from the Middle Eastern area, I'm pretty sure of that. But I have no idea what the origin of it. I think it is an Israeli thing because you do see it everywhere in Israel. I mean, I don't really know where it started, although it is everywhere in all, other countries too. Um, it's more of an Israeli thing. Man, we're pretty much steak and potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> no. There's no falafel. I wish there was now. It seems to be a big deal, so. <laughs> but as someone from the Middle East, they might have more of an opinion on the matter because it turns out some bristle over the ownership of the falafel sandwich. It seems there is a resentment over Jewish restaurants calling the falafel Jewish. I heard that and I think it's crap because the falafel is a Middle Eastern food and Israel isn't, I mean, they, they took the falafel and they're trying to claim it as their own, but it's, it's something that, you know, the Arabs have been doing for years and years and years. But I'm biased because I'm Palestinian, so. It's wrong. It's Middle Eastern recipe, it's uh, 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 Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, those countries' uh, recipe, it's not there. Their food is chopped chicken liver, their food is beef in a pot. Case closed, man. Falafel is a Middle Eastern dish, it's not a Jewish dish. Their dish is chopped chicken liver. Our dish is falafel. Like it or not. It may have been okay without the Israeli propaganda, calling it their national snack. Has the Jewish culture appropriated this dish without giving proper credit to its Arab roots? We will meet with restaurant owners, both Jewish and Arab, and some neither, to get their feelings on the right of ownership of the falafel. We also will speak to some in academic circles, one, a published scholar on the subject of food and culture. The topic, in the case of the falafel, has many sense, may be more symbolic than it is substantial. Leslie Jacobson is a member of the Judaic Studies Department at the George Washington University. This is a hot situation. And, and of course, these things are not about food. And so, you know, you've got people that are overly sensitive on one side, and then you've got the overly defensive people on the other side, uh, you know, and I think that's what's going on there. On the other side of DC's Beltway is the owner of a kosher market and deli in the multicultural town of Rockville, Maryland. Mordecai Yitsaki, who quickly tells you that everyone calls him Morty, has fond memories of growing up in Jerusalem and remembering how falafel was the accepted dish of both Jews and Arabs. I cannot speak for all the Israelis, but the people this in Jerusalem, everyone loved the, the falafel in, in the old city. Everyone. They, they would go to eat hummus and falafel, and this actually was uh, as a treat for a lot of Israelis to go to the, to the old city to have falafel and hummus in some of those places. Is, uh, the Israelis believe that they invented the falafel. Well, I'm sure it's not true, but uh, everyone likes to believe they are the inventor of something. And that's what happened with the Israelis. Uh, so every corner you will find probably three or four shops of, of falafel until today. Scott Bennett and his wife Ariane opened Amsterdam Falafel and Fries in Washington, D.C.'s Adams Morgan neighborhood. Their chef is Walid Abu Hawa a Palestinian-born American. But Scott keeps an arm's-length viewpoint on the issue. Because personally, I don't have a dog in that fight, and I don't want So <laughs> I'm staying out of that. I mean, who hates the duck? The falafel has evolved throughout the years. I mean, you can tell. You can just look at the ingredients that are on our, 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 our table from the pickles. 
Uh, things like beets, for example. Yeah, this is, you know, you can look at that and say, wow, that's got to be an Israeli. Falafel is a world food. It has many different versions in many different cultures and many different countries. And so it's not just a Middle Eastern food. It's now become also a European food and hopefully will be becoming an American food as well. Well, he comes from that culture. Uh, you can teach, and he does. He does teach employees here how to make it. But it starts with him. It's a gift from his culture to, to the rest of us. I like the tahini sauce. <laughs> I believe uh, historically it uh, was actually a gift from heaven sent down to the people of Jerusalem. Just what is this gift from heaven? Uh, originally from Israel and I love falafel. Falafel is damn good. It's a yummy, yummy food. Thumbs up for falafel. <laughs> By way of demonstration, Amina Ganem explains the art of falafel. First, you start out with garbanzo beans that have been soaked overnight. Into the mix go fresh onions, parsley, garlic, jalapeno pepper, and cilantro. Fire up the processor to get the consistency of a fairly smooth paste. Now add your spices, salt, cumin, black pepper. Add crushed red pepper if you like it spicier. And the crucial part, baking powder, which helps stabilize the mix. Now it's ready, it's chopped and rested for a little bit. And we wait for like 20, 30 minutes, and then we go ahead and fry. And then you stay with us for a little bit. Back in the kitchen, Amina starts by heating up vegetable oil until it is good and hot. With her special utensil, she shapes the falafel into walnut-sized rounds. Into the oil they go until they are well browned. This only takes two or three minutes. Pull out the savory fritters and put on absorbent paper. You're done. See? This is a falafel. You can tell from inside how nice and fluffy. It's not mushy and soggy. And look, it looks good. The parsley and, and it tastes good too. Now that we can see what all the fuss is about, we thought we would do some further investigation into our issue by going to the big city. New York is considered the mecca of ethnic food, where the term melting pot is defined. We came here to study falafel, its provenance, and its governance. This is arguably the most famous falafel shop in America. Mamoun's falafel is in New York City's Greenwich Village. The city's always been like that. The city, I think the city's like the, 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 the quintessential example of what a melting pot's supposed to be. Jalal Chatter is one of the co-owners of Mamoun's falafel. Mamoun is his dad, who is from Syria and opened the restaurant in 1971. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said for people breaking bread together. I mean, it's a traditional thing that, you know, we broke bread together, like, you know, that expression. I think there's a reason it's there. When you eat with somebody, there's a bond that happens. I had an Israeli guy come in one day, and, I, you know, he was a little drunk, and I'm sure that maybe, you know, something happened, or he got a call from home, or maybe there was a bombing somewhere in the Middle East. And, so he's like, he comes in, he's got a chip on his shoulder. He's like, give me two falafels. And then I'm making it. He says, you're Arab, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm Arab. He goes, well, you know, this is Israeli food. I'm like, all right, sure. You know, you want that to stay or to go? That's my, that was my response. I mean, what am I going to do? Get into an argument about where all the shit came from? Like, does it matter? You can't help but enjoy the company at Amnon's Pizza and Falafel in Brooklyn's Borough Park. Amnon's remarkably has an equal fan base of falafel and pizza lovers. 
and it's kosher under rabbinical supervision. Leon is called over, one of the experienced chefs. We are the first people open in uh, Brooklyn, in New York, to sell falafel. One of the first people. So we're famous from Pitkin Avenue to Flatbush to Borough Park. Leon has worked at Amnon's a long time, and he quickly shows us their line of frozen products, which are sold nationally. Amnon's falafel is nationwide. Frozen falafel, you could buy it anywhere in the United States. California, Florida, even Mexico, all over people travel. The best uh, falafel. We have uh, the frozen stuff, quality. Frozen quality. Frozen quality, right. California, Las Vegas, anywhere you go, you see us all over. I realize that it's a great way of accessing different issues that bother us, um, like relationship between Israelis and Arabs. Food and culture is a very complicated and nuanced matter. It is a topic that has recently found greater interest in study, both in popular mediums and in scholarly literature. Dr. Yael Raviv teaches food and culture at New York University and has published many articles on the topic and is currently authoring a book. It's all, all the, these things are topics you can approach through food. Food gave me a really nice um, sort of entry into very um, sort of grand questions that are very hard to grapple with, like, you know, nationalism, national identity, who Her we are, where we come from, that sort of thing. Later published in the magazine Gastronomica was titled Falafel, a National Icon. It detailed how the Israelis began to embrace the falafel as their own symbol of national culture. Zionism brought um, groups of Jewish people from all over the world into a new country and had to meld them together and had to, had to forge unity, to forge a Jewish nation out of a multitude of, of ethnic groups that had very little in common, really, when you come down to it, in terms of cultural products other than the religious part. They just used every cultural product in, that was available to them to create this unity. And falafel was perfect because it wasn't a Jewish food, because it didn't belong to any particular ethnic uh, group. It didn't belong to the Polish Jews. It didn't belong to the Yemenite Jews. So all the Jews in Israel could use this particular food product as an Israeli food. Food was just one of, of, one of the instruments that was available to the Zionists to, to create um, a nation, a Jewish nation. Food as nation building can be seen all over the world. First, one only has to look at France. This from a review of a recent book on French cuisine. French food uses diet as a window into issues of nationality, literature and culture. Food permeates the very idea of Frenchness. The Arabs feel that the falafel rightly belongs to their culture. Is this just another brick in the wall between the Israelis and Arabs? Like everything else in politics, it's a, it's a question of your point of view. If you're looking to see oppression and theft, you can see it everywhere. I, I, I don't think that that was the intention in this particular case. Well, everything is politics. You know, wh how we dress is politics. What we eat is politics. Um, you know, a, a woman wearing a traditional headscarf is politics. It's not fashion. Y you know, so uh, I think that um, if relations between uh, the Arabs and the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Israelis were easier, it probably would just be a source of humor. Um, and maybe someday it will be just a source of humor. But, you know, because there are so many other tensions going on, you know, suddenly it becomes, even our food! They're taking even our food! You know, and you can understand how people would feel that way. Now, it's not like the government one day, um, you know, somebody in the government got up and said, oh, let's make falafel a national icon. No, but what happens is when falafel became popular enough, um, the government can say, somebody in the tourism often can say, oh, let's make a picture of that, put it on a postcard, stick a little flag in it, and use it as um, um, material for, you know, in our consulates abroad. It makes sense for Israelis wanting to fit into the region to choose foods that are of the region, like hummus, like falafel. It's a problematic choice because the foods, because they chose foods that are Arabic and the political situation is so, is so um, uh, tense and so problematic. So everything, every choice, um, every 
uh, item that would have been taken uh, from one culture and adopted by, by the other would be problematic. Now that it's really become you know, more popular, it's, um, we can, now we can also acknowledge the origins. But um, you know, we've, we've, it, it's uh, established enough that we don't have to worry about it. You know, nobody's going to stop eating falafel tomorrow, even if there's a huge big war. So um, you know, we can acknowledge the source. When, we, when something from another culture gets appropriated, because it's so popular, because it's delicious or beautiful or whatever the reason, it needs to be acknowledged. I mean, in other words, people need to say, this is where I got this from, and isn't it wonderful? As opposed to just taking it and suddenly, I mean, in a way, it's like plagiarism. You know, you can't take somebody's idea and just suddenly say, it's your idea or somebody's book or somebody's painting or whatever and just suddenly say it's yours. And I think that's true with food as well. Maybe we should pay loyalties to the, to the Arabs when vending uh, falafel. But it, it is, you know, I, I, I can probably agree with the Arabs, most, most of the Middle Eastern countries, that the falafel came from, from the Middle East. I mean, the Israelis did not invent it. it it's no question. It's not a question.